for 10 years I had bad dreams. And when I had small children, myself, I remember having a dream that we were going to go to camp. And we must take with us everything that we're going to need for the next three years. And I must think, what do I need? I need this and that for the children. I must have this, I must have this, I must have this. And I was busy getting, making sure we had everything because we were going to camp. On December 7, 1941, Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor marked the outbreak of the Pacific War. Citizens of allied nations living in China awoke to find that their countries were at war with Japan. Cut off from their homelands and faced with an uncertain future, for these people, it was like a nightmare come true. After the Opium War, China opened its doors to the outside world and large numbers of Westerners came in. It was a time of huge social changes. In the first half of the 20th century, large numbers of Westerners already lived in China, working as missionaries, doctors, teachers, or businessmen. Despite their different nationalities and professions, they were all considered foreigners, even though many spoke Chinese and ate Chinese food, and some Western families had lived in China for generations. On July 7, 1937, the Marco Polo Bridge sparked Japan's full-fledged invasion of China. Many of China's foreign residents were citizens of neutral countries and for various reasons chose not to leave. Preferring to stay and suffer the ravages of war in their adopted home. Innocent people were taken hostage by the war machine and many happy childhoods came to a sudden halt. Only to be replaced by the shared memories of the Weixian internment camp. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. 
Flash, Washington. The White House denounces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to WOR for further development. After Pearl Harbor, Japan and the U.S. formally declared war and World War II became a truly global war. In reprisal for the internment of Japanese Americans, Japan established an immigrant internment camp in the Shandong province in Wei County, in the area today called Weifang. Known as the Weisen internment camp, it became a wartime home to as many as 2,250 citizens of allied countries, including over 300 children. The Japanese uh, troops and officials occupied our houses and kept us in the houses for quite a few weeks. We were under house arrest. Um, and then the, um, uh, they allowed us uh, to move out of our houses. Uh, they took account of all our possessions. Uh, they took some of our possessions. The money that we received from our home countries, Britain and America, was of course cut off when war began because the banks were not operating. The worst thing that happened was just shortly after the war broke out, after uh, the Japanese guards, you know, uh, the naval, the navy, officers, they came to our school. They said they wanted all the older girls to be comfort women for the Japanese Navy. The headmaster and others, they talked for six hours and they said, this is a boarding school. We are responsible for these people. You will it's an international crime to do such a thing. So in the end they went away and they said uh, we will make our decision. And what they, they never came back. But what they did was to take Korean girls. Weixian is located in the central Shandong province and is an important stop on the Qingdao Jinan Railway. With convenient rail links to Beijing, Tianjin, Jinan and other major cities in northeastern China. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese decided to create a camp in a U.S. Presbyterian church compound called Le Dao Yuan, or the Courtyard of Happy Way. Beginning in 1943, group after group of Westerners arrived in Wei Xian under military escort from Beijing, Tianjin, Qingdao, Taiyuan, Yantai, and other Japanese occupied areas. Australian-born Joyce has deep feelings for China. Her father was an officer in the Salvation Army and a talented musician who could play a number of instruments. He got on his bicycle and he went to every mission station in Beijing. And he said, we don't know where we're going, we don't know how long we'll be there, but we will need music wherever we are. If you have an instrument, please take it along. Aside from a few necessities, people bound for Weishen were not allowed to bring anything with them. 
Still, some people found clever ways to sneak musical instruments past the Japanese guards. What the Weishan inmates did manage to bring with them was something that no invader could take away. Courage in the face of hardship and an abiding belief in love and human dignity. My father had a very ingenious plan and he put all three between the two mattresses and then he put then the, the springs on the outside and then he bound it up with this rope and uh, Japanese thought it was just the beds going in but it was musical instruments going in. The first day that was after a long trip, well, that lasted uh, maybe two, two or three days, eh? and it was in the afternoon. And uh, in March, I think around the 17th of March, something like that. Hmm? So we were rather surprised because that was not exactly a prison. That was the, the houses and the building of a Presbyterian mission. But the Japanese had added towers to watch on six corners hmm, with, with machine guns. Now the Japanese soldiers just ruined the compound. They took almost everything out of the hospital or broke it down. Most of the windows were broken. Uh, the uh, toilet facilities were all broken up and were not working. And uh, a lot of the uh, buildings uh, were broken and so when we arrived it was, as it were, hardly fit to live in. Lodal Yuan's 11 hectares were divided by walls into separate living areas for the Japanese and the foreign inmates. The better buildings were used by the Japanese while the immigrants were left with dilapidated buildings and streets covered with weeds and garbage. Families lived together in small dormitory rooms, while single males and females lived communally in classrooms or meeting rooms. The inmates had no access to running water they were forced to share primitive toilets, crude stoves, two shower rooms, three large communal kitchens, a dilapidated church, and an empty hospital. And uh, I think it was like any other village uh, with 2,000 people inside with, with the good, the bad, the, the, the nice people and those that, that, that weren't so nice. The outlook at first was dire. The compound was in worse shape than they could have imagined. The inmates were given little food and forced to do physical labor to which they were not accustomed. Add to this the conflict that is bound to occur when so many people from different nationalities are squeezed in together. And it is easy to see why desperation set in. For the inmates of Wei Xian, life had taken an abrupt turn for the worse. And finally, amongst us, we organized. Hmm? not taking care of the Japanese, we just, between ourselves, we organize and say, what can you do? The Japanese agreed to allow the inmates to govern themselves. Amid the chaos, discussions were held and representatives elected, and the Self-Governance Committee was formed. The camp was divided into four divisions, with each division sending nine representatives. 
These 36 people form nine committees. Education, Management, Engineering, Barracks, Healthcare, Food Supply, Finance, Labor, and Discipline. It was these committees that were responsible for managing camp affairs and for accommodating, negotiating with, and struggling against their Japanese captors. According to Japanese regulations, all inmates, men and women, were required to work. Only infants, invalids, and those over 80 years old were exempt. The Self-Governance Committee found people to work as bakers, cobblers, maintenance men, boiler technicians, and doctors and nurses. They repaired the hospital, put in a drainage system, and fixed the toilets. People took turns cooking, washing clothes, tending fires, making charcoal, and emptying the garbage. Children went to school, then after school took their turns working. We would assign the jobs to look after our little community. So I did the laundry. I did the washing. My brother, Norman, was stoking the fire, putting the coal on the fire and making the hot water. And I was at the tub scrubbing with many other people, scrubbing the sheets and the clothes. But we had no soap. We, we were bitten all night by the bed bugs. And there were spots of blood on the sheets. And I was trying to get it out, but I couldn't get them out, never. So we, we just did our best. When I was first in the camp, one of my jobs was to take the rubbish out. We had to gather the rubbish and take it out in carts outside the camp, about one or two hundred meters outside the camp. And uh, it may sound a dirty job, but it's difficult to describe to you the thrill of being able to get outside the camp. Fifteen or sixteen hundred of us in there, so to actually get outside the camp, oh, the relief, that was wonderful. In the fertile soil of the camp, seeds took root. They were inmates in an internment camp, but it was their internment camp, their history, and their destiny. To prevent communication with the outside world, the Japanese erected high walls around the camp and covered them with electric wire. But this didn't diminish the generosity of the local Chinese residents, who provided the inmates with invaluable help over the course of their imprisonment, creating lasting bonds of friendship. A black market was organized by Australian priest, Father Scanland, and with the help of Chinese locals, goods were traded late at night in a hidden corner in the camp's northeast sector. The process of procuring supplies was a dangerous one for the inmates, who risked being discovered by the Japanese guards. But for the Chinese, who carried the goods over the electric fence in the middle of the night, these black market transactions were truly terrifying. Mm -hmm. 
，下面再躺木板，因为它这个两层电网的形状这么上去，里边还一层电网那么下去，说必须两两个电两边都躺木板才能过得去。Danger was everywhere, but the will to live kept these nighttime activities going, even under the watchful eye of the Japanese searchlights. However, some Chinese locals paid a disastrous price. The Japanese left his corpse on the wire as a frightening and ultimately effective warning to anyone who offered help to the foreign inmates. And at that point, quite a number of the internees who had been working over the wall with the Chinese uh, decided that we should not carry on because it wasn't a danger to us if we were caught and we should just be put into solitary confinement. The Chinese who were seeking to help us, they were in risk of dying as that one had died. And so uh, at that time the trade over the wall began to ease off and after about nine months, 12 months, uh, very little food came in. A report on Weishen released by the Shanghai Consulate General on March 9, 1944, indicates that the camp's Japanese personnel changed frequently, but generally consisted of a commanding officer, divisional officers, a police chief, and 30 to 40 police officers. The Japanese army had not made adequate preparations and lacked the management experience necessary to manage such a camp. They were trying to enforce harsh living conditions to humiliate the inmates and break their will. The physical labor took its toll and arthritis, back pain and nerve damage were common. Many inmates also suffered from diarrhea, gastric ulcers, diabetes, tuberculosis, and other acute or chronic illnesses requiring special treatment. Fortunately, there were no major outbreaks of contagious diseases. Both physically and psychologically, inmates were stretched to their limits. Without their black market food source, hunger set in. Taking control of their own destinies, the inmates sent messages into the outside world telling of their plight. It was at this time that the former Guangwen Middle School principal Huang Le De and others took action. Uh, Entry to the camp was strictly controlled. The only Chinese people allowed in on a regular basis were workers who delivered food, cleaned the latrines, and did repair work. Zhang Xingtai, who emptied the camp's latrines, was one of the few Chinese people allowed in. My father 
啊，也没有条件非常差。通过你也把写封信，写封信出去找着黄老德，啊，找着黄老德吧，啊，叫他求求帮助。他把那个信呢，就放入那个，就电木头通的，那个木头底下垫着。他这个老的那个每个都下脚啊，下脚、呃、那个驴坐不住啊，一下的事儿晃荡晃荡晃荡，反正拉上一路。日本人一看就是捂住过嘴就吹吹吹吹吹，就逮出来了。When Huang Lede received the letter from the camp, he and his family began raising money for the inmates. The complex political situation. Hindered their efforts, but after overcoming numerous setbacks, he convinced senior Kuomintang leaders from Changle and Shouguang to contribute. 募到这些钱吧，和和家里自己的钱加起来一共有三十万。Over three separate attempts. The Huangs were able to raise the equivalent of over 100,000 U.S. dollars. The money was given to a diplomat at the Swiss consulate in Qingdao, who used it to buy urgently needed supplies in the name of the International Red Cross, which were gradually transferred into the camp. The Weixian inmates took control of their own fates, and by forming the self-governance committee, took control of their own affairs. They maintained their dignity in the face of adversity, and turned what could have been a nightmare into a source of inspiration. People were quickly organized according to their professions and talents. Among the inmates were accomplished artists and musicians who used their free time to record impressions of camp life in watercolors and charcoal sketches. A band was organized and named the Salvation Army Band. It played frequently at both the hospital and the church, and its music helped bring people together and comfort lonely hearts. These watercolors, though painted inside the camp, are full of lively colors. Steel wire. And high walls may imprison the body, but they cannot imprison the yearning for liberty, or dim a spirit born to shine. The inmates even cleared out two athletic grounds, which were used for 